Welcome to Lessons in Leadership, Steve Adubato with Mary Gamba. Mary, how are we doing today? Doing great, thank you, Steve. How are you today? I'm doing great. Listen, I want to uh, set up the interview everyone's about to see. I sat down with Rick Thigpen, who is a history buff and a top executive at PSEG, longtime friend of ours. He's appeared on Lessons in Leadership many times. And in this interview, you're about to see um, an in-depth conversation. Talk about extraordinary leader. That's Frederick Douglass. People, you know, people know the name Frederick Douglass. Oh, yeah, Frederick Douglass, uh, the abolitionist movement. Um, yeah, who was that again? Is Fre no, we need to understand who Frederick Douglass was, why he mattered as a leader um, in our nation that changed the history of our country, who have, many argue, the greatest influence on Abraham Lincoln when Lincoln was president in the 1860s. He was a leader who people don't really understand. He was born in, um, back in the 1800s and early 1800s, was a slave, got himself educated, became a writer, a scholar, a speaker, a leader. Uh, Mary, in researching this, how much did you learn about the great- Oh, so much. Douglas? And the, the connection to leadership, you and I always talk about, well, number one, Rick Thigpen, the most amazing historian ever. He knows something about anyone and I, it's just so great to watch him, but really just learning about Frederick Douglass as a communicator, how his communication literally changed history. And I think often when we look back at uh, famous people, whether it's historians, politicians, we forget about the spoken word, about the importance of communication, being specific, because you truly cannot lead and you truly cannot initiate change without being an effective communicator. To Mary's point, it isn't just uh, Frederick Douglass and his extraordinary ability to communicate publicly as a speaker. He was a great writer. He communicated in writing. And um, again, the courage. I mean, we think about, Mary and I talk a lot in Lessons in Leadership about courage, about grit. I mean, could you imagine what we're talking about? Frederick Douglass at that time saying that he wanted to, we talk about innovation and change, pivoting around COVID, changing the world, changing the history of our nation by leading the abolitionist movement to end slavery. That's leadership. That's Frederick Douglass. And this is our friend Rick Thigpen talking about the great Frederick Douglass. Hi, everyone. Steve Adubato. We're honored to be joined by our good friend Rick Thigpen, the Senior Vice President of Corporate Citizenship at PSEG and a history buff who we turn to to understand uh, the past and how we get to be who and what we are today. And let me introduce this book that I've been working on for a while. There are countless books about Frederick Douglass. This book is Frederick Douglass, Prophet of Freedom by David W. Blight. Considered one of the better books about Frederick Douglass, but what you will not find in this book, you're gonna learn from Rick right now. Uh, Rick, thank you for joining us, my friend. Hi, Steve, how you doing? It's always a I'm pleasure. I'm doing great. I, I, history I, is I, so I, important, Steve, so thank you for doing this. You know, I called Rick a, a couple of weeks ago. I said, Rick, I wanna do Frederick Douglass. He goes, what, I, you're New Jersey-based, so what are you doing with Frederick Douglass? And I, the truth is, Rick, Frederick Douglass does have some connection to New Jersey. New Jersey has some connection to the Underground Railroad. Railroad. First of all, as a leader, what makes Frederick Douglass so incredibly important in our nation and in our world history? Well, so Frederick Douglass, first off, was born in 1818. And the fact that we in 2023 are still talking about his words speaks for itself, number one. Everyone who can hear my voice will wish that over 100 years later, somebody was talking about the things they thought or said or did. And so that's absolutely outstanding. But a runaway slave born into slavery in Maryland and was able to run away from slavery, but not only just run away, he was able to educate himself and really develop into one of the outstanding leaders in this country at a time when African-Americans we're in a very difficult position. Half of our country practiced slavery. All of our country practiced discrimination. And the opportunity for African-Americans was limited, was severely limited. And Frederick Douglass was an absolutely exceptional talent who was able to use his words to help galvanize a nation. He became one of the leading abolitionists. Even as an African-American, he was able to have his voice heard and became one of the leading abolitionists in a time when the voices of African-Americans were suppressed frequently using ferocious tactics. And he was able to 
uh, become the first African American received in the White House, and I believe that was President Lincoln who first met it was. With him. It was, and he was able to help our president at that time understand the challenges of ending slavery. You know, yeah. um, it was a senator from Massachusetts who said at the end of the Civil War, reason, justice, and humanity were powerless when it came to dealing with the slaves, but necessity proved to be irresistible for our country. So Frederick Douglass's words, galvanizing our nation really touched lots of hearts and minds, but it took an armed conflict, a civil war to end the scourge of slavery in this country. And it's really unfortunate that words could not do it. And yes, he did have a New Jersey connection. I believe the year was 1849 when Frederick Douglass came to New Jersey to speak. And he of course came to none other than Newark, New Jersey to speak. It was a governor Daniel Haynes at the time, who was a Democrat and a protege of Andrew Jackson's. I can only imagine how pleased he was to have someone like that. Andrew Jackson was a very popular politician in this country, but he was also a former slave trader and his political success was built on supporting the slaveholding South. So that's why I say that. But, but, but first of all, do you know, do you know the church? You, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see if I can test you, Rick, because there's nothing you don't know. 170 years ago, Frederick Douglass visits Brick City, Newark, New Jersey. I don't believe we were called Brick City at the time. No, um, I don't think so either. OK, but he, co he comes to deliver remarks at this church. You know the church? I do not. I know it's a Presbyterian church in Newark. I don't know the name of the church. Plain, only because it's in my notes. I got this. Just, it's the Plain Street Colored Church, which was called at the time the first African and Presbyterian Church. How'd you know it was Presbyterian? I read. <laughs> I read. For all you how young people you out there, so I read. Much. That's how I knew. Yes. I, I love history. And of course, I love New Jersey history. And I can only imagine in 1849. You know, the importance of this is New Jersey was one of the slowest states to end slavery and to embrace the idea of equality or rights for African Americans. So coming here was not friendly territory. It was certainly not Mississippi or Alabama or Georgia, but it was not friendly territory. New Jersey needed and frankly could still benefit from work on improving its views of the importance of equality for all people, depending on the, you know, I'm sorry, regardless of the color of their skin. Mm -hmm. But there's another piece to New Jersey, another piece that yes. our team, and Jackie Tricarico, our executive producer, if you remember mm -hmm. them, um, researched this and came up with this. In Cape May, and some people they talk about the North-South yes. Jersey divide, Let's the Cape Bay, certain places below the Mason Dixon line, if I'm not mistaken, Rick. Yes. 1850s, Harriet Tubman, together, she worked with Frederick Douglass to move slaves through New Jersey through the Underground Railroad. Harriet Tubman, yes. talk about a great leader, and Frederick Douglass, Cape yes. May, New Jersey, please, Cape Rick. Cape May, New Jersey. So, a couple of things. First off, Steve, I learned a lot about this from a gentleman whose name you probably remember. He was a state senator from the great city of Jersey City, and I believe former mayor, which is Glenn Cunningham. Oh, Glenn did a lot of work on the Underground Railroad, and he's the guy who brought a lot of this out as well. And the Underground Railroad, in fact, was alive in New Jersey. And despite the fact our state has such a regrettable record in this regard in the past, New Jersey, in fact, was a place where the Underground Railroad thrived. And through New Jersey, many people were able to escape to freedom. So it's something we should be proud of. It's not something we talk about a lot, but it's good to bring up the name of Glenn Cunningham because Glenn did a lot of work on this topic. And I'm so proud of Glenn for doing it. May he rest in peace. And he really helped illustrate that fact. And so Frederick Douglass was one of those voices that you can look back and say he was a voice ahead of his time. He spoke about freedom. He spoke about mm -hmm. equality and treating people with dignity. Things we kind of like to take for granted today, but things which he had to risk his life to do and escape slavery to do. So we have to admire him. And I believe the year was 1888. Frederick Douglass became the first African-American to receive a vote at the pres a presidential nominee vote at one of the major parties' political conventions. So he achieved an enormous amount of success. He's a role model for so many people. But none of us should ever forget it took armed conflict, not words or appealing to the hearts of people in this country to actually end slavery. And he played an important role in helping make some of that happen. You know, there's so much as a student of leadership, as Rick knows, so much as, you know, talk about Lincoln's leadership, Abraham Lincoln, yes. a great leader. But he to lost New Jersey fact, twice. Say that again. He lost New Jersey twice, I said. Again, that's why Rick, <laughs> people go, of course Lincoln won. No, he didn't. He lost twice. He but lost. if it were not for Frederick Douglass in the ear of the president, helping the president understand 
History may have been very different, Rick. It may have been very different. I will say again, that armed conflict didn't hurt Steve in terms of accomplishing the goal, but there is no doubt that Frederick Douglass, his words, he inspired many Americans. He also helped the president of the United States see his way through to things like emancipation and equality for people, regardless of the color of their skin. Hey, Rick, real quick, I got 30 seconds left. And also his son served in the military for, for, for the union. And also he, Frederick Douglass pushed for African-Americans to serve in the military when some were like, no, we can't have them with us. He was the leader of that effort. Is that fair, Rick? Yes. He was one of the important leaders of that effort. Again, Steve, it turned out to be necessity that made it happen. And there is no doubt that the leaders at the time said that the emancipation of the slaves and arming them was one of the keys to the union victory. And without doing that, the union may not have been over to, been able to overcome that great rebellion that almost destroyed our country. Frederick Douglass, an incredibly important leader, uh, impact on this nation, a New Jersey connection, if you will. Rick Thigpen putting in perspective. Let me also say, just remind folks that PSEG is a longtime underwriter supporter, not just of our work, but of public broadcasting overall. Uh, Rick, thank you, my we friend. We support New Jersey too, Steve. Thank you very oh, much for having me, Steve. And thank you for talking about history and having people focus on how many people have contributed to our history from different backgrounds. Thank you for doing that. Well said, stay with us, we'll be right back. This edition of Lessons in Leadership is made possible by the Bucino Leadership Institute at Seton Hall University, Prager Metis, Valley Bank, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, the North Ward Center, the New Jersey Sharing Network, Delta Dental of New Jersey, Fedway Associates, Inc., Veolia, resourcing the world, and Seton Hall University, showing the world what great minds can do since 1856. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. That's stand-deliver.com. Promotional support for this edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba, has been provided by NJ.com, NJBIA, and New Jersey Business Magazine, CIA NJ, and Commerce Magazine, and Meadowlands Chamber, celebrating 50 years of building connections and driving business growth. This is the Seton Hall story, one that comes to life every day on our campus. This is the place where great minds discover, innovate, collaborate, and find their true calling. This is the place where passion has a purpose, where learning inspires leading. The bonds we make, the values we teach, inspire our community to take heart and take action. This is Seton Hall University. This is what great minds can do. The essence of the Northward Center is ingrained in our values, thoughts, and actions. What began as a storefront on Bloomfield Avenue has evolved into a life-changing community nonprofit. The mansion is steeped in tradition, but with all of its grandeur, the true essence of the Northward Center is in the people we serve. So as the Northward Center commemorates 50 years of service, let's also celebrate the many opportunities yet to come. Lessons in Leadership is honored to be joined by our longtime friend, Frank John Tomasi, one of the leaders of a terrific law firm in the state, uh, Chiesa Shahinian and Gian Tomasi. Hey, Frank, how are we doing, buddy? Great. Thank you for having me on, Steve and Mary. It's really an honor and a pleasure. You know that. It, it, it always is. And tell everyone about the firm, because you are in some new digs, my friend. We just moved in exactly one week ago. We took over uh, 105 Eisenhower Parkway. Uh, uh, we were committed to Essex County, Steve. We were going to relocate from West Orange, but we would not move to Morris or any other county. So the search was uh, a little difficult, but we found uh, the, uh, the old Arthur Anderson uh, Global Headquarters at 105, uh, again, Eisenhower at the North and End. In Roseland, Roseland, New Jersey, right? Yep, Roseland. We met with the mayor. It was an abandoned building, so to speak. It hadn't been really major occupied for a long time. And uh, together with the landlord, we uh, put in a, a very, very serious package of uh, improvements and renovations. We did uh, 120,000 square feet from ceiling to floor. The rotunda is, uh, you know, to respect our clients, the cafeteria, the workspace, the, the, the everybody loves it. You think you're in a tech headquarters. It's really very modern 
and uh, follows all the new things that we read about post-COVID. Well, Frank, I'm glad you mentioned this because you, you made you and Jeff and the team and our good friend Donald Founder, the chief marketing officer uh, who promotes the work that you're doing at the firm so effectively. I think, wait a minute, the firm just expanded. They moved to this new headquarters. Half of us are remote. We're not even in an office together. Explain to us and talk about innovation and leadership. Why go big with a new place, new digs, when so many folks are doing this? Well, we believe that this is part of the new normal, not the new normal. We believe this is an integral part of the new normal. Um, we built approximately 44, 45 huddle and conference rooms, all Zoom capable, okay? Um, we don't have a telephone anywhere in our office. They're gone. We are on a complete Zoom platform. So we're recognizing and respecting what you're talking about, but we also believe that a business our size, if you don't get people back, if you don't create that connective membrane that was there, if they're just tethered together by a paycheck and a virtual existence in their home with you know, eating crackers and whipped cream, it, it, you don't have a business. And so we bet on and we bought into a return to work, but we wow. changed and adapted and morphed it into a new semi-virtual, semi-present uh, return to work. Well, there's a lot going on there. Frank, that, that is leadership in and of itself, that innovation. By the way, I, I was remiss to not mention that Frank is also the chair of the board at the Beth. And uh, the Beth, Beth Israel um, is part of the RWJ Barnabas Health family. RWJ Barnabas Health, one of our longtime um, funders on our public broadcasting side. And I do a fair amount of leadership and communication coaching at RWJ Barnabas Health. Mary, jump in with Frank. <clears throat> yeah, definitely. So it's funny that you mentioned family, Steve. And Frank, as I hear you talking about the people on your team, it sure does sound like they are family. Can you talk a little bit about the connection between family and leadership? In particular, who influenced your leadership and communication style uh, in your life? Uh, well, that's a good question for me. But I, I will tell you that we have a motto here uh, at the firm, and it's family first. Um, and that's for real. Uh, we don't just talk it, we walk it. So we tell people all the time, come forward with your family dynamics, whatever they may be that are challenging you or that, that need us to pay some special attention to your moment in time or, or your, your change in your living existence. And we're gonna support you, right? Um, we learned, I learned a long time ago that, that you know, using the word leader means that you have to show the team that you care um, and, and you have to care, right? You, you, know, you can't, if you're faking it that you care, you're not leading, you're, you know, you're failing. So we do care. And, and we want to know our team, we want to know about one another's uh, spouses and about their kids and about their family, uh, the travails. And, um, you know, on the Beth, when somebody needs uh, help with a, with a sick one, or there's a pregnancy, or there's a, a dramatic problem with a COVID vaccine, you know, they would come in my office, not to talk about the law, but to talk about their, their need. And, and we always responded here. Um, when, when people need money, people need support. That's the way we lead, Mary. Um, my, my, my technique in, in running what now is the, I think we're the largest law firm with lawyers in New Jersey. There are some bigger firms than ours, but uh, I don't think anyone has as many lawyers practicing in New Jersey. You know, it's been built up 44 years of working with, you know, I clerked for the assignment judge of Essex County. I worked with some great lawyers. Um, and work with some terrible lawyers. Uh, so, you know, some of our leadership uh, uh, tenants, uh, Mary, are, are not based on what somebody said, this is how you should do it, but it was from watching others fail in leading. So um, it's, it's an amalgam, it's an amalgam. Um, but I, I like to think that, um, that some of the great people that I've worked for uh, showed me the way I worked for a guy, Ed Madden, um, who was a former assemblyman, uh, sec it was the Secretary of the State of New Jersey Bar Association. I mean, you couldn't find a more compassionate man. When it was time to work, we had to work. But we all put our shoulder behind the effort because we knew that he cared. And I keep using that word. Um, leaders can't just order you around. It's, they've got to get into the trench with you and, and be there with you. Along those lines, my good friend Mark Burson, a colleague and mentor of yours, um, Just I just want to mention Mark because 
talk about a great leader and, and philanthropist. I want to follow up on something, Frank. Uh, several years ago, our firm, Stand and Deliver, did significant leadership development. We had actually had a leadership uh, development academy at a competing law firm. And one of the things I learned in, in doing these seminars and doing the coaching was that a fair number of folks at this firm were good lawyers, I guess, in terms of how they define lawyers, but teaching leadership, including business development, Frank, they were like, well, what do you, what do you mean? I studied the law to practice law. I said, I know, but you're in the, the leadership academy. I'm teaching you how to run a meeting, how to engage in business development, how to strengthen your relationships, how to develop other people. And I'm realizing it's a totally different skill set. Frank, am I making too much of that? I, I, Steve, you're, for me, you're right on point. You know, you learn how to write a brief, you learn how to make an argument, you learn how to, to practice law, but you know, it, the, the law is, is your commodity, right? It's your inventory, right? But then you've got to manage a business. The business is the network behind the law. It's exactly what you're talking about. And, uh, managing the business means responding to the team and their needs. And remember one thing, Steve. Every law firm has support staff. And a lot of law firms make a mistake, in my opinion. They think that it's the lawyer that makes it all happen. And if you don't respect the total team, if that paper, if the file clerk doesn't get that paper in the file, when you're on trial in front of a jury and you go looking for it, it's a bad moment. Um, so, so the team's got to clear. Um, you, you, again, you lead by letting them know that that you care about them and then they're gonna care about you and they're gonna do a better job for you. So managing the business of law is what you're hitting on right now. It's the business of law. How are we gonna conduct the business of law? It's hard to teach somebody how to originate clients because clients, Steve, they want lawyers because of their judgment. You know, Mary, listen to how much of our work uh, you know, remember that previous law firm. And also, it's not just the legal profession, but we've done leadership academies all across the country. Mm -hmm. People go, I'm really good at being a lawyer. I'm really good at being an accountant. I'm really good at being a healthcare professional, which uh, Frank knows very well. But leaders, no, I didn't go into this to be a leader. I go, but wait a minute. Just because you're a good teacher doesn't make you a good principal. Mary, That's jump right. in and with Frank. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah definitely. I, I just, you know, we... As Steve mentioned, it, it's not necessarily an innate thing, the ability to lead, but I want to shift gears once again. Talk a little bit about relationship building. You obviously have such ties to Newark. I know that you've been a convener, bringing people together, building a new future for the city. Talk a little bit about the importance of relationships tied to leadership. So, so look, we have 185, 186 lawyers every day. We have another 190 staff people, okay? We need to understand everybody's needs and, and we need to work with them and support them. And we specifically through me, you come in my office like a temple to Newark, right? I, I, I don't forget where I'm from. And, um, you know, a lot of our employees and our staff are from Newark. And so we try to blend together uh, the need quotient of our entire team and support uh, the, the, you know, I told you before, Mary, we're committed to Essex County. We're likewise committed to Newark. So, so when we have people that need a doctor and need some help because of my role at, at the Beth, we integrate them with the Beth, right? Uh, when we have people who need something at the Prudential Center, we'll make a call down there or, or, or we'll call John Schreiber at NJ NJPAC uh, because somebody's got a special child that might need some special attention. Um, and we, we, we show everybody how that, that spider web of relationships uh, benefits everybody. We don't covet, conceal, uh, you know, we don't corner our relationships. We share our relationships. So, so uh, if somebody's going to take their, uh, their date out for a good dinner and they say, Frank, where's the best restaurant in Newark? And I'll send them to restaurant A or restaurant B. And but, I'll but it'll make be, that Frank, call. it'll I, be in the iron bound and you know it. That I was just going to say, we, gonna, we Frank, can do this here. Frank, yeah. what is that restaurant? Frank, if I said to my you. Old neighborhood, my old neighborhood in the North Ward of Newark, it will not be there. It'll be in the iron bound. Just admit it. Well, if I were to go to the North Ward, Mary, I, I, it would be a Peruvian soup dish that I would be having. There's no more Italian restaurants. Everybody forgets <laughs> the Belmont Tavern 
Belmont, and don't forget, don't forget Luigi's. We've had some good no, times Luigi's at Luigi's. Is, Luigi's is the last man standing, Steve. It's, All right, uh, leave it on. it's the okay. best because it's on its own. When right. Biazzi's closed, it was over. He, he took Frank, the don't hurt our people. Do not hurt our people. Right now. <laughs> go back, Frank, go back to relationship building. I, Mary and I, we, we in some of our seminars, we talk about strategic relationship building. It's something we try to teach people. For you, it's natural. You're a that's who you are, Frank. Yeah, Frank knows that guy. Frank knows this person. How the heck do you teach relationship building? I, I bring people with me constantly. I never go to a meeting alone. I never go to lunch alone. I never go to dinner alone. And, and I'm constantly reinforcing the things that I think that helped me to be successful. You never know when you're a success or a failure, really. But I think I, 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 I try to share um, those experiences and share those relationships. I had a client from came in from Jersey City last night. We took him to dinner at a great Italian restaurant uh, at Davina's in uh, West Cordwell, by the way. <laughs> a really good spot. Right on Bloomfield and, Avenue. Uh, it's the best. An old school. Yeah. yeah great. Excellent. Great. Old school. And, and by the time the client left, he had uh, Mario's telephone number, the owner of Davina. Mario, the owner, is the best. <laughs> yeah. They, they, they bonded. And they're going out to dinner Monday night in Jersey City. And, and so, Mary, you know, what Steve's talking about, it was my client, it was Mario. And all of a sudden, Mario is saying, Frank cares about me. And my client's like, wow, what a great relationship. Um, isn't it all about interpersonal relationships? Which is, again, why I go back to Steve's first question. We bet on people coming back to the office. We bet on people needing the touch needing the, the, the network again. So we're pretty, you know, Frank, we're pretty confident that people are coming back. Frank, I cannot thank you enough um, to you and to Jeff and to Dawn and the support team at GSC. Uh, we wish you all the best. Congratulations on this new move. I look forward to coming up and visiting. We do so much of our work remotely, but there's nothing, just nothing like being with your friends and colleagues and business associates in the place where they do their business. And so I look forward to being there. Frank, on behalf of the Lessons and Leadership team, we wish you all the best. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. And thank you, Steve. It's a pleasure being with you. You got it. This is Lessons in Leadership. Steve Adubato, Mary Gamble, which, who Frank said should have her own show without me. Get me out of the way. I'm she ready. Can she can do it. She can Frank, do it. Do not, do not let Frank represent you, because then I know it'll happen. <laughs> small <laughs> piece, a small piece. I just want to wet my beak. That's hey, what I mean. Don, Don Finucci, don't, don't be quoting certain <laughs> movies right now. See you next time on Lessons in Leadership. Hey guys, Don, great to be with you. Bye -bye. Just wet my beak. See you next time. <laughs> This edition of Lessons in Leadership is made possible by the Bucino Leadership Institute at Seton Hall University, Prager Metis, Valley Bank, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, the North Ward Center, the New Jersey Sharing Network, Delta Dental of New Jersey, Fedway Associates, Inc., Veolia, resourcing the world, and Seton Hall University, showing the world what great minds can do since 1856. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. That's stand-deliver.com. Promotional support for this edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba, has been provided by NJ.com, NJBIA, and New Jersey Business Magazine, CIANJ, and Commerce Magazine, and Meadowlands Chamber, celebrating 50 years of building connections and driving business growth. Construction companies work at the heart of our communities. So do the operating engineers of Local 825, who build our roads and bridges and ensure the safe transmission of energy that keeps us on the move. Local 825 works with contractors as partners in quality, safety, and training. Our achievements stand as monuments to collaboration that will last for generations. This message has been brought to you by the members of Operating Engineers Local 825. Better building begins here. This is the Seton Hall story, one that comes to life every day on our campus. This is the place where great minds discover, innovate, collaborate, and find their true calling. This is the place where passion has a purpose, where learning inspires leading. 
The bonds we make, the values we teach, inspire our community to take heart and take action. This is Seton Hall University. This is what great minds can do.